more online tracking. The good news is that Duncan's done part of this for me, so that's, that's kind of handy. Um, consider for a moment a line follower, which I would not necessarily build to look like this. It's purely a representation. Um, but you would typically have a robot body and uh, a number of sensors, okay? Uh, which will stick with no more than four, but that's fine. Uh, and in this one, uh, I have made sure that they are arranged so that two of them are over the line. Now, in practice, they would be slightly further apart. Don't get too hung up on the geometry, right? It's an illustration. Now, you've made your line sensor, you plonk it down on the line, and you know that you want it to move along there and ideally not wander off into next door. Uh, so you have to consider how things can go wrong. And they can go wrong in several ways. One way is that the mouse could be heading off with an angle error. Right? Its center is on the line, but it's heading off next door. And you don't want that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what's the other kind of error you can have? Well, we'll call this an offset error, right? So we've got an angle error and we've got an offset error. Now the, now the robot is parallel to the line, but no longer properly oriented on it. And, but the sensors, they can't tell. Uh, and of course, you can combine these errors and still get the same sensor reading. So you've got two independent errors which you need to correct, do something about. If you look instead at a micromouse, typically they will have walls to track and a pair of tracking sensors pointing at the walls. Um, I've put in here some little axes. Remember earlier I said we always would consider the robot in the X direction is the direction of travel, and the Y direction is uh, at 90 degrees to that. And of course, the micromouse in the maze has exactly the same problems. You can have an angular error, and so the left sensor will get a larger reading than the right sensor. You can have an offset error, and the left sensor will get a larger reading than the right sensor, and you can have a combination error and you have no idea what you've got going on. None at all. You cannot tell with two sensors. Uh, we will, I'm not sure if I, I can't remember if I do actually, to be honest, but notionally I quantify an offset error as EY uh, and theta for the angular error. And the, the burning question when you, you try to run either a line follower or a micromouse is how to correct this. Now, one problem is that, well, let's first note that these are identical problems, okay? Don't, don't have any other illusion. Line following and wall following are exactly the same problem. So if we can get a solution for one, we get a solution for the other. We have a robot with two independent errors. What can we do about it? you have to note that the robot is constrained, badly constrained. It cannot move sideways, right? And this has a huge influence on what we do. Well, in engineer, any kind of engineering, if we've got something that needs to be controlled to within some limits, what do we do? We need some kind of feedback system, right? Uh, and so we have a process, we have some kind of feedback measuring the output, and we have some kind of controller or compensator which looks at the error between where we want to be, where we really are, and just um, output some kind of control signal for what we want to do. And if you don't know any different, and even if you do know different, you go searching around for prior art, because that's always good. Okay, who else has fixed this problem for me? Can I just do what they did and will it work? Uh, and you generally come up with, everybody says, well, we'll use a PID controller. 
throw it, just use a PID controller. Well, in the, it, take my word for it for the time being, you don't need a PID controller, but you probably do need a P and a D part, right? The integral part has its place for different kinds of problems and can be uh, an essential part of the solution. And in fact, if you couch this problem in different terms, you might end up with a PI controller. But that's not what we're doing. Okay? Maybe you'll see, maybe you won't, I don't know. So this is all very well. This is classic stuff. This is what you'll have you'll find if you go and look about, or if you think back to those lectures from your dim and distant past when you were dreaming of the summer. Um, the P term, so we've got an error, output, input. Subtract them, get an error. Still, we don't know if we're dealing with a y error or a theta error, right? Because we can't distinguish them, it's just an error. And we use a simple gain on that error for the proportional part, and we have a differential term. And here's something which nearly everybody seems to overlook if they're not doing this professionally. And I don't, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not <coughs> preaching or some kind of control systems expert, I'm just reminding you of things that trip me up all the time. The D term is acting on the rate of change of the error. And it's this here which people mess up a lot. There is a delta T in all this, right? It's the amount of change in error divided by the amount of change in time. And if you don't take that into account, you'll find strange things happen. So this is generally what we do. Measure something, correct it, put it out, and hope everything gets better. Well, what does the robot system look like? A robot, our robot, is some mysterious box of motors and batteries and electronics, and it puts out what you can measure as its x position, its y position, and its angle in some absolute coordinates or relative coordinates, it doesn't really matter. That's all you can find out. And these are the only things you can change. Yeah? Everybody happy with that? Don't want anybody coming back later and saying, well, what if you change this? What if you change that? This is what you've got. V and omega. Forward speed, angular velocity. Now you can look at it in other terms. You can say, well, I can apply an angular acceleration and that will change the velocity and whatever. But in the end, that's what goes in, that's what comes out. It's actually obviously slightly more complicated than that. It's a two-wheeled mobile robot. So when you have a look at it in slightly more detail, and I'll just give you a moment to do that. All right, so this is the robot dynamics. This is the robot from the previous picture. And there's an angular velocity going in, there's a velocity going in, and it does magic, and you get some outputs here. Now, you could try and measure these. But how? How are you going to do that? We've already determined that you can't tell the difference between a y error and a, an angular error, so how are you going to do it? It's difficult. You could use a gyro, integrate the gyro angular velocity, turn that into an angle, right, and, and do that, but you won't, because you haven't got one, probably. And certainly at a basic level, you're not going to have one. You could use the wheel encoders to try and get the angle, but since you don't know what the angle should be, that's not going to help you. Going around the line following track, how do you know instantaneously what the angle should be? You don't, right? In a maze, you can kid yourself on that you know if it starts at zero, you know that it should stay zero or be 90 or be minus 90 or whatever, right? Um, you can do that, but you don't. So what you do have, though, is the difference in the encoder counts, which tells you about the angular velocity. You do have the sum of the encoder counts, which tells you about the forward velocity. You can take this angular velocity, ignore this, Compare it with your desired angular velocity, generate an error, feed it through a PD controller, um, and so forth. You can take your forward velocity, compare it with your desired forward velocity, 
feed it through a PD controller, and so on. All this is just a reminder that, in fact, the left wheel speed and the right wheel speed are controlled by V and omega. So your forward speed contributes directly to the left wheel speed and directly to the right wheel speed. Your rotational speed, your angular velocity, is the difference. Okay, so you've got your control signal for angular velocity, positive to the right wheel, negative to the left wheel. So positive angular velocity means you're turning that way. Or I should say that way. Right? Now, what can you measure? The only thing you can measure is that sensor difference, that, those sensor readings from the line sensor or the wall sensor. There's no good feeding it back in here, is there? Because that's just going to control the forward speed, and you would like the forward speed to stay constant. You don't really want to be speeding up and slowing down just because you've got an error. I mean, you can do that. Right, and we'll have a look in a minute that, that, that quite often people do. But it would be best if you had a constant forward speed. So the only place left to put it is somewhere back in this angular velocity loop. And take my word for it, because on a future evening session I will prove it, right, in a different talk. The most convenient way to do this is to pretend that this error is an angular velocity. It's not, obviously, but think of it as if it were. There's a kind of rationale to it, because um, if you've got an error and you do nothing about it, is it going to get better or worse? If it's an angular error, it's going to get worse. If it's an offset error, it probably won't. Um, but anyway, but my original intent for this talk was to talk about why this is so. It turns out I don't understand it well enough to explain it and be certain that you follow me, so I'll have to come back to that. Right? There's, there's some things which I've discovered whilst I was doing the work for this which made me question my, my innermost beliefs. Uh, the only thing that you might be upset about is that there is another PD block here, okay? Um, and that's because I think people think of them as controllers and they're not. The system is the controller. What these blocks are are compensators, right? These are compensating for this error and driving the control system. And so this is turning this fake line error into something that can be treated as if it was angular velocity. Um, and it's independent of the rest of the control. So it's a PD block. Um, it has a proportional part, it has a, uh, a derivative part, uh, and we'll see in a bit how those contribute. Having right. seen the block diagram, I'm surprised it works at all. <laughs> I know. <laughs> because all you do is translate a bad data signal into, which is obviously, no doubt, angular error and an offset error. It's yes. Be a one without it. I mean, you bound to have both of them into hopefully one that's better, but it might not be. Well, there is there is a, a proper derivation for this, right. which would have taken too long today, even if I could have done it without my notes in front of me. Are you saying you've got proof that it does make things better? Yes. Okay. Right. That's why I say for now, take my word for it. Right. right. On another occasion, yeah. when you're really feeling bored. Um, <laughs> I can demonstrate that under a certain yeah. set of circumstances, this is true. Right. You, you feed it back as if it were an angular velocity, uh, and life is good. So this is the bit that Duncan's done for me. Um, I have, or had, I've taken it apart now, a UK Mars bot with four line sensors, two marker sensors. It's one of the standard board designs, right? I built them all, tested them all, verified they worked. I ran it at contests so that um, I was confident before telling everybody to use it that it would work, right? So I don't want anybody coming back saying, this doesn't work. It does, I know. Um, 
what you have here is the result of um, reading the sensors as you get the robot to spin in the spot over the line. All right? So it starts off parallel to the line, spins through 360 degrees, and this is the record from the sensors. So you can see these are the marker sensors. Uh, the response for the marker sensors is very different in two obvious ways. One is it's much larger, and another is that it's much flatter. That's by design for the version I built, because the marker sensors are really effectively binary outputs. Right? I want them to just switch quickly when they detect a line. Whereas the line sensors have this triangular shape, close to, to Duncan's perfectly good model of a cosine. Okay? Um, I would only say that on this one, I adjusted stuff so that they gave a pretty triangular pattern, all right, which is, has its own benefits. The reason it has particular benefits is um, you sometimes hear about people using a single sensor to track the line, and you assume that this means it has to be bang, bang, but it doesn't because this... If you just take any one of these, that's a straight line, right? And you can ride that slope, a bit, a bit like you would do for slope detection for FM radio or something. You can ride that slope, okay? If you go off, you're doomed. But as so long as you can still see something, you're okay. If you go off the wrong way and you end up on the other side, you get positive feedback instead of negative feedback, right? And then it may come right, it may not. But you can use one sensor and ride that slope if your sensors are set up like this. You might notice um, two other features. See if you're paying attention now. Two other interesting features of the data. Whilst I have yet more to drink. What would you expect to see which is wrong? That's by design. Just Yeah, I want to be certain that they're going to see anything that even looks a bit like a... No, um, they, they should cross, they, this bit here should come back at 180, but it doesn't, right? So you are all asleep. Uh, and it's just because the, the robot was actually pushed off to one side, and so it took more than 180 degrees to get back round, and then slightly less to get all the way back round there. The other is that um, these lines don't come back to zero. Okay, so... Um, We'll, we'll get back to that. Duncan's already done it, but we'll get back to that. So the obvious thing to do is to have a look at these two middle sensors um, and combine them. Um, and the simplest way you can do that is the way uh, uh, I think Duncan described originally. Uh, the uncompensated line here, the red one, you just take the left one minus the right one or the right one minus the left one. Don't do anything else with it. And you get this slope around zero or 180 or wherever it's supposed to be. In classic um, systems, you would divide by the sum. So you could compensate. This is there's nothing else going on, right? You would divide by the sum so that you can compensate for varying brightness. If you were building a, a radar system or a missile tracker, you'd take the difference divided by the sum. Yeah. Yes, probably. <laughs> um, thank you. I'll see if I'll remember to correct it, but you're, you're quite right. Um, if you do that, two things will become apparent for reasons which slightly puzzle me, I have to confess. If you do the compensation, the result is more noisy, right? Because it's, it's taking into account variations in brightness in the floor and all sorts of stuff. You'd think it would comp can cancel out, but it doesn't. And the other is that the slope is different. Why do you care? Because this slope is your gain. Right? That's your feedback gain. And you, you want to keep that constant as you, as you make changes. You, you can't just go around saying, well, I think I'll try compensating it because that will fix this problem. It'll change the gain, and then all of your control system will be out. Right? Your constants, your carefully calculated constants, will have to be retuned. So when you're looking at this, do what you can to keep this slope 
the same. One thing that we can do, as Duncan's indicated, is we can normalize our sensor responses so that the lowest value they ever have is zero, the highest value they ever have is some nominal value of your choosing. If you're using Arduino and you haven't seen it before, there is a function specifically for this, the map function, right, where you can take in your actual sensor value, you can give it the smallest sensor value that you've ever seen, you've recorded that in your calibration, the largest one you've ever seen, and say this is the range I want it mapped to. And it's just it's built in, you just feed your sensor reading through it and, and you get it back out. It doesn't mean that these all come to the highest value, but it means that each one somewhere does that. It sorts out, this is reasonably well put together so they don't need much compensation, but if they were, if they were different in sensitivity, this would fix it. Uh, and that gives you a slightly better error function. So what I've done in, in this one, which surprised me, uh, is I've shown several ways of calculating the error using these normalized values. And I've multiplied them by minus one, minus three, one, and three. Duncan used minus one, minus two. I used minus one, minus three. Uh, there is a reason, um, which I forgot to make a slide for. If that's your line, and that's a sensor, that's a sensor, that's a sensor, that's a sensor, right? These are all the same distance apart, two units. So that's zero, one, two, three, uh, one, minus one, minus two, minus three. So that's why I've used those numbers. Um, and the general explanation is that these numbers are proportional to the distance away from the line. Right, and so that's, uh, that's weighting them. Then you can take the difference. Um, as before, um, they're all shown on one here. It's a bit confusing, so we'll skip the actual sensor readings and just show the differences. So this is using just the middle two, and this is using all four of them, right? Exactly as Duncan showed earlier. Um, and you get two benefits. One is you greatly extend the range. So you're going plus or minus 30 degrees as opposed to plus or minus, I know, maybe 10 or 15 degrees by using more sensors. You get a very linear response. And going back to what I was saying earlier, the slope is pretty much the same and doesn't change greatly just by adding more sensors. Quite a lot of code I've looked at, by the way, uses the add up all of the left ones and add up all of the right ones and not do the weighting. Um, although it's not great, uh, out here you still have a steering function. You still have an error. It's just not as big as you might like. Right? So the, the difference is still positive or negative, and so you still get a steering function. From a logical point of view, surely you, you know those outer walls are wrong because you've got signal from your inner sensors. But if you're applying a linear equation that you don't know. I mean, this is, you know, the inside of that slope versus the outside of that slope. You're what you mean, this signals. bit versus this bit? Yeah. yeah. You know all I'm, all all I'm saying is you have a linear response, response yeah, which, which is, is a control engineer's dream in the center section. In here, yeah. but that doesn't mean you don't have a valid steering solution outside that range. You're still moving it. You've still got an error of the correct side, and you're still moving it in the right direction. It's just no longer linear. Yeah. I mean, from, because you've got multiple sensors, you know that outside of it's not the inner loop side, it's the outer side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I mean, in practice, if I was building a contest one, I'd have, you know, six or eight of these, so. Yeah, you differentiate the slopes. The slopes, you put that As you go down here? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, life's never great. Right? You, don't want to, you don't want to get out here. I'm just saying that you still have something that tells you I've got to turn right or turn left. Yeah. 
So, when you have a look at the, this, now we've switched over to um, a maze solver, right? Just because these problems are interchangeable. And I've got a left sensor and a right sensor. I always display the right sensor as a negative value um, because if they all overlay each other, it's hard to see what's going on. And I can kind of contort myself to imagine I'm going down a corridor this way and that's the one on the right and that's the one on the left, okay? So it, it, it helps me to mentally map it and it makes it easier to see. Right sensor, left sensor. I think, I don't even know if it's at constant speed, but it's moving across a total of six cells and there's a wall at the end. Uh, and you can see the posts, by the way. Uh, and you can see that the walls are different. So we've got a, a, a dark wall, a light wall, a dark wall, or a pair of them. Uh, you can see that you can use the value of the front sensor to tell you when the side sensors are becoming unreliable because they're also seeing the front wall, right? You get quite a lot from this. And notice also that I always plot distance on the x-axis, not time, because that's the important thing in many ways. But look, these sensor readings are pretty noisy. I, I see people bang on about wanting to have 12 bits of, of analog resolution on their sensors. This has got eight bits and there's noise in it, right? I've thrown away four bits of ADC resolution and it's still noisy. Don't get carried away, you don't need it, it's a problem. Um, and remember what I was saying earlier about the differential term in your controller, right? This is looking at changes. These are all changes and if I, have a look at the D term that I get from my controller. It's magnified for dramatic effect, but you can see it's banging around all over the place. It's not great. What can I do? Well, the simplest thing to do is to low pass filter the sensor readings. All right, use a software filter on them. That make, it doesn't change anything about the information, by the way, you can still see the posts. You can still see the different walls. It won't materially affect the performance of your control system, but it will fantastically reduce the noise and nonsense that you get from the derivative part of your controller. Okay, um, and that's um, an, an important consideration. Uh, the low pass filter is an exponential moving average filter. If you're not, have you, anybody who's not seen that before? All right, um, remind me, I can send out links or look it up. It's an exponential moving average filter. Uh, you can rearrange it and do it with one multiply, one add per cycle. So it's very cheap, the pro processing power. Very cheap. Perhaps just the way that 10% is your reason for 90% old reason. Yeah. Yeah, so this, in this particular case, it is 10%. You didn't say that somewhere, have you made that up? Oh yeah, point one, right. So yes, it, it, it just adds a small proportion of the new reading. So that, that, but that's going to give you a, a lack for doesn't the matter. For the control system, it doesn't yeah. make any difference. You won't notice. I mean, if you want to model it up and add it into the controller, fine. I'm just saying that this, this is not enough to actually for the job it has to do. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Ready? Would you so you would just you feed that into the steering? Um, it's, because so if the, you were the looking box, for the edges and things, you wouldn't want that. Oh, oh wow. well. Ah. Yeah, different. Remind me about edges. <laughs> um, how do we do it? Uh, uh, this, this is the, the steering function. function. Mm -hmm. This is actually from uh, a wall follower, but the same thing will do for a line follower. I assume this is calculating the steering error. Assume it's nothing. So one of the questions people have with a, with a micro mouse is what do I do if there's only the one wall or if there's two walls or no walls? Um, 
if there's uh, you you find out what your right error is, what your left error is, different you know just the difference between that and the nominal value that you've calibrated. If both walls are there, just take one from the other. If only one wall is there, only use the corresponding error. But for goodness sake, remember to multiply it by two. Because if you don't, your slope is half, your gain is different, and your steering function won't work. Once you've got your steering error, you have to turn it into an adjustment value. So we're now in that PD block, right? We've, we've done our feedback, we've done some sums on it to get a number, and then we go to the PD controller, the P term is easy. It's just my constant times whatever the error is. The D term is my constant times the change in error divided by the loop interval, the DT term. Put it in. Nearly everybody who shows you how to do these things leaves it out. They just put in some arbitrary value or they give you advice on how to calculate the D term. And that advice is meaningless if it hasn't incorporated, how did that happen? If it hasn't incorporated the loop interval, right? Because, sorry? No, it's not rate of change if not doing that, right? Or more accurately, the number that they have shown in their example includes this correction, right? And so you might get a number that's like 3,000 instead of three, um, and you, can, you can't work out why, the, what? How can it be that? It's nonsense, right? So. Oh, you mean if, like, if it's a one millisecond? Uh, yeah, if it's a one milli, if it's a one millisecond cycle time, right? Yeah. Yeah. They've done it in their sums because they were taught badly how to do it, right? It says, oh, you you increase your p term till you get some oscillation, back it off, increase your d term. We talked about all this before in an evening session. Um, but it means nothing if you're not correcting for the, for the loop, loop interval. Not least because um, if you then decide to change your loop interval, all this will change, right? But if you change your loop interval now, it's taken into account. And if you don't like the divide, then pre-calculate a constant, which is just um, your loop frequency, frequency and do a multiply. We just pre-calculate Sorry? If you pre-calculate steering KD, divided by loop interval, then... Yeah. Yes. You've done one calculation once. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to call it KD at that point, but <laughs> KD or DT or something. Yeah. If you look up, there's... um, oh, I can't remember his name now. There's a guy done a series of articles about uh, improving the beginner's P, PID controller, which you'll find on... Uh, and he correctly identifies all of these things, but doesn't make a big thing of it, so it might, you, you can miss it in the explanation. Um, this is a debatable part, right? So here's the question. Uh, I'm gabbling now because I'm running run out of time. But if you go faster, should your steering correction be bigger or smaller? What's, What's your gut feeling if you haven't already worked it out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, if, and if you do the research, you'll get both answers. Yeah. <laughs> When I'm driving a car, I make smaller steering moves when I'm going faster. Yeah, yeah because when you're driving a car, um, you're interested in getting back on track after the horn's gone. Yeah. Right? But you can't afford to do it too violently. And what you're concerned about is how quickly you get back on track, not how far you have traveled whilst you're getting back on track. If your requirement was, I had better miss that bollard, right? You're going to steer harder, aren't you? So it kind of depends on how you couch the problem. And if your problem is in terms of, let's say, I must correct an error within two cells, you definitely need to be steering harder at speed. That's the thing. You want to do the same thing. You want the same curve at the higher speed as you do at the lower speed. Right. You want to do so, the same thing. Exactly. So I think this is another thing I can't prove rigorously, but I will do. Sorry? Well, well, these are all subject to some surprising amount of debate, right? And it all depends on how you derive the problem. I have seen perfectly good 
mathematical derivations which have completely opposite outcomes in terms of whether it, you know, which bit should be proportional, which isn't. I'm suggesting as a good first approximation, make the whole adjustment proportional. And this is speed over speed max explore. Uh, and this is because you typically only get to tune your robot at a given speed. You don't get to tune it at lots of speeds. And so if it's correct at that speed, then this will be one, right? If your speed is that speed, this adjustment will be one. And if it's higher, it'll be bigger. If it's lower, it'll be smaller. There should also be a, a term in here which um, stops it being zero. That will do that. You remember the last error for the DT term, and away you go. This is equally valid for a line follower, right? Because you have the same problem. You don't want to be back on the line sometime later today. You want to be back on the line within, I don't know, six mouse lengths or whatever, it, whatever your requirement is. Um, oh, and then this is the actual rotation controller itself. Um, I've got, there's a, an error in, uh, in angular velocity, which is what the current angular velocity is minus what it should be. I have a flag in which lets me turn off the steering, right? But I still calculate it so that if I want to log it and see what it would have been, I can still do that, but I can turn it on and turn it off. This is what I was saying this morning about turning on and turning off the steering at different points of the explore. Uh, then you do this. This now is that other D block, right? In the angular velocity feedback, there's a whole set of terms for that. And then you get the output. Uh, and the bit with all the nasty arrows is just this. You've got a forward result, an angular velocity result. Forward is left, sorry. <sighs> Add them together for the right output. Subtract them for the left output, turn them off to the right, and away we go. Inner line following. Uh, well, with, with the main source, when you're going down the straight, I assume you should be going for an angular velocity of zero. Yes. With the line following, what should you be aiming for? Angular, angular velocity, velocity of zero. Round it. Just, Just leave it at zero. Yeah. Right? You have no. Yeah. So, now, nah, well, that's the thing, right? So whilst you are just following the line, first time round, set your, your controller angular velocity to be zero. Then if you're clever, once you've judged the radius of curvature of, the t of that curve, and you've decided on a speed, from that you can calculate what the angular velocity should be to get around that, and that's, that becomes like a feed forward term, right? And then you say, once I've hit this turn marker, I want to set my angular velocity to be 25 degrees per second, right? And then that goes in there. And now, as we've seen before, your controller is compensating for errors from that rather than from zero, right? So the second and third time round, you hopefully would have an idea of what omega should be, and you're trying to drive the robot to do it. And then the controller is just keeping you within limits. Um, so, apart from anything else, what should you take away? Be consistent. If you've calculated controller gains, make sure that you don't do anything to upset the slope of the, of the feedback function. That's the main thing, right? Um, and you do that best by normalizing uh, your sensor responses uh, using known good test cases and working away from them. Um, don't go reading how to do this and assume that anything that you read, anything that you read, including mine, is applicable to yours, right? Unless you're doing everything the same way. And since people very rarely explain the inner workings, you can't know that. So it's a problem. Um, always use real units wherever possible. You can pretend, you know, that this is, the the error is so many degrees or degrees per second, I don't care. But work in degrees, millimeters, seconds, right? Don't use arbitrary sensor units, clicks of the encoders, widths of a grain of sand. Use real units because otherwise you can't communicate with anybody else, especially if you're all working on the same class of robot. Oh, mine's got a 
feedback gain of 63. 63 what? If we haven't got the same units, there's no, not even any point in saying it. And in, make sure that your differential term accounts for the loop time. Now, I think I've actually really overrun. Yes, badly. I have a question about the filter. Yes. yes. You're taking, uh, surely that depends on your. Is that every time you sample the center? Yes. So, yes. surely that 10%, the knee on the temperature will depend on, uh, on the filter, the low pass filter if you're able to depend on the sample frequency you see. The 10% might not work very well. With it. No. no. Well, well it, it will, right? Because. It's all taken account of elsewhere. It doesn't. It, it's arbitrary. Just, just a low pass filter. Just get yeah. the I just wonder what the need was. I just wonder. I was just mentally trying to calculate that. It has a time constant of five sample times, I think. Yeah. So it depends on your. Obviously, it depends on your sample frequency. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we'll, we'll introduce a lot. So you, if you're not sampling very quickly, no, I just wonder what type of type of Honestly, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, a, a couple of quick things, if I may. One is um, somebody asked me about going around a wall, around a post. Right. Um, it will take me too long to find the slides. I can show you separately. But if you use that low pass filter, You've got some data, and there's your wall gone, right? Um, if you have a reasonably fast low pass filter and a very slow low pass filter um, on the same data, okay, and you subtract one from the other, you'll get nothing here, boop, and you found the edge. Right? Uh, and it's cost you almost nothing, just these two filters, one of which you were going to use anyway. Um, and one of the things you can do is you can say, if this slope, because this is a measure of the slope of that, if this slope is high, don't trust the sensors for steering anymore. Right? So that tells you you've got an edge, your sensors are dangerous, don't use it. Or you can look directly at the derivative and say if the derivative is, is too large, that means there's a slope. Don't trust the sensors anymore. Pretend they're, they're working fine. Does that answer that question? Yeah. So also, um, this is one advantage of searching quickly. The faster you go, past, <laughs> the less of a problem that is. Well, that is true. If, you go around, if you go around very slowly, you can suddenly find you go right around the corner. First one, yeah. But if you're going quick, disappear and it won't be as much of a problem. Well, this this is a, a simulation mm. of, of a, a, This is a simulation of a steering problem. Um, if I start off with a Y offset of 10 millimeters, I'm not gonna crash. Okay, top graph is my, my error, my Y error. Um, and It's now reduced to zero, but if I start off with an angular error, clearly I'm going to crash, right? Blue line goes off, hit the walls, lose the sensor, whatever. I need to correct it. Um, I can do that with my PD controller. I can add even a small amount of P, right? And I get quite a decent result. Um, I haven't added any derivative term. This line here is when the error drops to within, I think, 5% or something. Um, if I add in a little bit of D, uh, looking the wrong way, right? it settles sooner. But down here, we've got the speed. We're doing exploration speeds, very slow, 500 millimeters a second. That's the speed. If I allow it to go faster, right, it takes me longer to settle. 
If I start the whole thing off faster, this is my speed at the beginning of the track, it gets worse. And the faster I go, recognize this behavior? Yeah. Right? It's because you've gone faster, it's getting out of control. And so what do you do? Well, you go, oh my God, I've got to increase the gain. No, that's not helped. <laughs> uh, maybe I have to increase the derivative term. That's not helping. I'll run through this properly when we do an evening session um, about how to work out a, a proper control law. Thank you. Assuming 